Metal Gear Solid. Keep us solid. When the game won an award, and then Mr. Kojima wasn't there to accept it, uh, I think people were very disappointed, and Kiefer Sutherland got up, that was fine. Great night, thanks a lot. But when we came back to me on camera, I just thought I had to explain why Mr. Kojima wasn't there, because I wouldn't want anyone to think that he doesn't want to come, or he's not interested, and he's, he's not grateful for all the uh, recognition. So I just was very uh, honest and said, here's what happened, is that he wanted to be here, but he wasn't allowed to come here by Konami. So I just think, you know, you have to be honest with the audience and explain uh, what happened. And, you know, Mr. Kojima is very polite, and I don't think he'd ever say that on Twitter. Yeah, so first of all, thank you for having me here. This is Thanks for time. coming here. It's great yeah, to have course. you at E3. Yeah, of course, of course. So last week you just announced that uh, the latest date of about this year's game, the Game Awards. Yes. What's new about that? Can you tell me something more? Yeah, this will be the fifth year mm -hmm. of the Game Awards. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be live on December 6th, mm -hmm. December 7th in China, mm -hmm. uh, the next morning. But yeah, we're really excited about it. Uh, you know, it's at our fifth anniversary show, and uh, it's been amazing to have all the Chinese viewers uh, watching the show. You, you've been a great uh, host Thank for you. the past <laughs> two years. We watched the pre-show. I see you there in the yeah. studio. Uh, which is amazing, and yeah, we're excited that the show will again be live mm -hmm. um, in China this year. We're doing it at the Microsoft Theater, actually right behind us here, yeah, uh, very close to E3. Mm -hmm. And we're going to make it a very special show because it's our fifth anniversary, so mm -hmm. we're going to bring back the orchestra, which was really popular last year, so we'll have full video game music. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we'll focus again on eSports, and we'll have some big game announcements. That's one thing that we were very happy with last year mm -hmm. is having a lot of big games revealed for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, so we sort of get through E3 here this week and then we move on to making um, the Game Awards. But it'll definitely be our biggest Game Awards we've ever made. Good, that's perfect. So what's the, what's the first idea when you came out to, you know, the, the Game Awards had become the largest on, off, uh, on offline events for the game show, yeah. kind of Game Awards. So, so what's the first idea when you came out to set up a kind of... You know, the Game Awards, I really started because Ever since I was a kid, I believe that video games are the most powerful type of entertainment mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I go to the movies, I watch TV shows, but when I play a game, it feels different. It's much more immersive, and, and I feel a, a better sense of control over the destiny of my characters, mm -hmm. and I, I really love video games. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was growing up, there were a lot of big American award shows for movies like the Oscars yes, or music like the Grammys, but mm -hmm. video games never really had something that celebrated all the hard work of the game creators, but also created an environment for all game players to come together, to unite, to celebrate how, how proud we are to play video games. Yeah. So that was really my vision, uh, to build an award show that could do that, and I worked for many years uh, with, with television networks in America, um, working on something called the Video Game Awards at Spike and other award shows, uh, but finally five years ago, with um, the sort of evolution of, of video on the internet mm -hmm. and, and uh, video platforms and live streaming, I finally thought I could make the show myself. Um, so five years ago, I invested my own money and said, I want to create my own show, I invited all my friends like Mr. Kojima mm -hmm. and all the other game developers to come to the show, and they were very gracious. They gave me not only their time, but also their support. Uh, and that's really how we started the Game Awards. Okay, that's good. You just mentioned your, about your childhood. Can you tell me yes. something that, did you grow up with the video games? Like that when yeah. you first can play the game, your dad just give you a, like a gift or something? Yes, yeah. When I was a, a young boy, uh, I remember my, my mother uh, signed me up for computer lessons. And I learned how to type and learn on a computer, like a traditional PC computer. So okay. when I was a young boy, um, you know, some people go for music lessons or sports lessons. I went to computer lessons. Okay. Uh, so I always had sort of computers around me in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and my mother would always work, do a lot of work on her computer and her accounting and things like that. But I would play video games. So I started playing a lot of uh, very early games, a lot of uh, adventure games that were story-based games. Um, George Lucas had a company named LucasArts um, that built uh, a bunch of uh, story games. and. You know, my, my sister, my younger sister, would always read books, and I would always play video games. And there would be so much text and story in these games, I really f found myself fascinated with them. So my brother and I would always play games. And yeah, I always had games around when I was a kid, um, you know, early Nintendo and um, early sort of uh, Sega games, mm -hmm. right? So like Sega Genesis, Nintendo 64, I was playing all those as I, as I grew up. So yes, I played a lot of video games as a, uh, as a kid, and I actually wrote my first article about a video game when I was only, I think, 13 years old. So even when I was still in school, uh, I was on one of the early internet systems in America called CompuServe. 
Uh, and I met an editor from a magazine there, and he asked me to start writing for them. So I've, I've really only, the only career I've ever known in my life is, is video games. So your, your parents never thought that the video games were like slow down your study or, you know, the, the, the no. negative effects? Yeah, no, my parents were very supportive um, of games. And I think, you know, the thing was, the games that I was playing, they were very rich story games. So there were great characters, and you were reading and learning, and it was uh, positive. So. Uh, yeah, they were very supportive of that, and I was, you know, still would have to do my schoolwork and, you know, make sure I did well in school and things like that. So I'd sometimes be, you know, writing, you know, paper for school and then, you know, switching over to the game to play. Um, but yeah, no, my parents were great, and they were very supportive, and they would also help, you know, uh, finance or fund, you know, when I wanted to buy video game systems. There was a system in America called the 3DO, mm -hmm. which was very expensive um, CD-ROM system. And it's I about 100,000? Yeah, it was uh, very, very 1, expensive. 1,000 right? 1, US dollars, yes, yeah, so a very expensive video game system. And I remember my, I was living in Canada at the time where I grew up, mm -hmm. and even more expensive in Canada. And my parents you know, were willing to sort of purchase it and invest in it for me, and I was always grateful that they were supportive of my hobby. So no, they never really said, you know, stop playing video games, focus on your studies. Uh, I, I was able to, I was a good student, I was able to play games, so that worked out well. But no, in many ways, I think the video games kept me out of trouble mm -hmm. because I wasn't, uh, you know, going out and partying or doing bad things, I was actually just sitting at home playing on my computer. So like a it was nerd, like, right? Yeah, exactly. I was yeah, a little nerdy. It was a little lonely, right? Because yeah, you're sort yeah, of by of. yourself playing games and they weren't as connected now on the internet, right? So you're playing by yourself. You weren't necessarily on the internet playing with people. Um, but yeah, my parents always were, were very supportive and I'm grateful for that. Okay. So is that because you're, uh, I mean, that kind of situation that your parents support you play the video game because yeah. Uh, you have a special family, or is very very popular in in the, in the American family? Yeah, I have a special family. They're they're very supportive. No, the special but, uh, is not that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but I think uh, yes, I think a lot of American parents, you know, support and embrace their children playing video games, and they're also you know very different types of games. So yeah. now you know, Minecraft is a very popular game in America um, that a lot of kids play, and they learn things like how, you know, how to build, and, and, you know, they're educational. So even when I was growing up, I was playing educational video games, mm -hmm. too. Um, there's a thing called Reader Rabbit that I played on my computer that actually I learned to read through a computer. So there are very positive aspects to games, too. Um, obviously, there are games that are a little violent or, you know, have other sort of uh, challenges to them, and those weren't the games I was playing when I was little. So my parents were, you know, they were always interested in what I was doing, and I think it's... I think it's common in America that parents know that children love to play video games and it's a way to you know, also play on a couch with friends, right? So mm. a family can play together with Nintendo and other sort of systems like that. Um, so I think it's, uh, there are positive aspects to games, but you know, I think there was always concern. There was this game um, series in America called Leisure Suit Larry, which was this, uh, it was like this uh, video game that was about a guy who would uh, you know, go around and try and date a bunch of women. And that was a game that was like more restricted for older ages. So that was a game that I wasn't allowed to play when I was little. So there were certain games that I couldn't play. Um, but yeah, my parents, and I think most parents in America are, are supportive of video games, but it's, it's a hobby. And it you know, can't be the only thing you do, but it's, it's a very good thing to do, I think, in America, and people respect it. Yeah, but, but back to 1970s or 1980s, yeah. but the video game, I mean, the consoles are still kind of a new thing to the family. That yes. Is, but but they, 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 your parents still support them. Mm -hmm. They won't think that this is a kind of a poison or kind of, you know... No, they were, you know, we always had our family TV and we would have like a Nintendo or uh, a Sega system hooked up to that. And then we would have our computer where we get to, you know, play games. And actually, I think they liked it because, you know, me and my brother actually would find something in common that we would play games together and we'd talk about games and we'd sort of trade games and things like that. So it actually became sort of a social thing where you talk to your friends at school. And it's like, oh, I got the new Mario Brothers. Let me yeah. play it. And so it was... It was sort of a popular thing to do, and yeah, my parents were always very, and I think a lot of American parents are very, you know, technology forward, and like many, many children now are walking around with their cell phones and things like that. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think there's always a worry that games could be poisonous just because people don't understand them, and there's some parents, you know, they didn't play video games. Now I think actually what's happening is that a lot of parents, you know, my age and older are... You know, they remember playing video games, so they actually want to share these games with their family and their children because yeah. they had such great memories. So I think it's changing. It's only getting better, not worse. But yes, when I was growing up, I'm sure there were some parents that were, you know, not fans of, uh, of, of violent video games. Okay, so because why I asked that, because, yeah. you know, the current in China, especially in the social media, yeah. that they give a lot of pressure on the games. So they mm -hmm. think the game will slow down the student's study, will... Yeah. Make, even they call the video games in China the, the, the electronic heroin. Really? Is that happening in, in America before? Like, 
No, I mean, I think there's always that concern, but what I say to people is that video games, there's so many different types of them. So, like, the first article I ever wrote about a video game was on uh, Sim Farm, which was uh, a guy named Will Wright created Sim City, a very yeah. popular game about how you plan a city. Mm -hmm. And Sim Farm, I was learning, actually, how you build a farm and, and, and how you, you know, the economics of it. And so there are games that actually, I think, helped develop my mind and think about, you know, things like how do you plan a city, or other things that, uh, you know, learn how to build. Or there was this game I played as a kid called The Incredible Machine, and it was this science game where you would have to solve a puzzle using all these different items and figure out how to build a machine. And so I actually remember a lot of the games when I was younger that actually were educational or helped me learn. Um, so yes, there, you know, there are games that are violent and there are other ones, um, but that's any form of media, right? I think there's always um, certain games that you shouldn't play as a child, but I do think the idea of interactivity is a very powerful way to learn about the world and you know, uh, actually sort of you know, experiment with things in a computer. So um, I think there's really positive aspects to games, and you know, in China, if that's, uh, it, it's, it's sad to hear that people see games as heroin. I think it's because it's... Uh, it's probably just a lack of understanding of all the different types of games and the opportunities, and you have to be mindful of which games you're playing. Um, and you know, anything, any hobby you have to do, uh, it's a balance. Mm -hmm. So it's not about you know, only playing video games and not doing your schoolwork. And I was always able to find that balance, I guess, in my life for whatever reason, to still do well in school, still play video games. And as I said, I think video games actually helped keep me out of trouble because I was at home playing games instead of going out and getting in trouble or doing bad things. So um, they worked out quite well for me, but again, every person is different, and you have to make sure that you're able to, to balance things and watch things. But I think putting any kind of label on all video games that you know they're all bad is just not true. Okay, so because in China, the, the social media has a kind of yeah, a lot of, spe a lot of pressure on, on the games. Even just like me, when I grew up, that my parents, that uh, they tried everything to stop me to playing games. Wow! But uh, now I was working in the game industry. Somehow you figured it out. Yeah, yeah. I was I was working in the industry, so they they, they come you know slowly and slowly understand what I'm doing. So uh -huh. the gaming is not a, only the negative things. Right. Yeah. So when you start your career, have you ever think about become like a game producer or something? Because you know every yeah. gamer would have a kind of dream yes. that we set up an, a game for his own, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have that? Yeah. A lot of people ask me that, and honestly, no. I never really have wanted to make a video game. Um, I, I when I was you just want to play, right? Play and all, but I also want to play, and I also like to support and cover all games. So one thing is, you know, I've thought at some points in my career, I've decided, well, you know, I could go work for a game company, mm -hmm. just, you know, go work for Hideo Kojima. But mm -hmm. then, you know, it would, would mean I couldn't work with everyone else. And I built so many relationships with so many people, I think one of the strengths of what I do is being able to unite and bring everyone together at something like the Game Awards. And, you know, I can't do the Game Awards if I also make a game because <laughs> I'd be biased, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I sort of have made the decision that I think I'm better supporting other game creators and supporting other games. And the things that get me most excited is when I can reveal a new video game on one of my shows and then it goes on to become a success. And the developer, I think, thanks me and credits me for helping expose the game to a lot of people. So for my entire career, I've really wanted to celebrate all games and help amplify the people that make games versus make games myself. Let's go back to the, the Game Awards. Yes. That the, 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 the year before last, that you, when you announced the kind of uh, awards for Mr. Hiro Kojima, yes. that he can't come. He couldn't so come. So no. yeah, you say something for him. Yeah. Is that you have prepared for that, or you just came out on the stage? No, well, so yeah, uh, a few years ago, Hideo Kojima was nominated for a number of awards for Metal Gear uh, Solid V, mm -hmm. um, and it was very public that he was uh, you know, going to be leaving Konami, his employer that he, he built Metal Gear with, um, at the end of that year. But our award show was in December. So it was kind of an awkward situation because people knew he was going to be leaving Konami, but he was up for awards. So we thought, you know, even though he's leaving, he probably still could come and celebrate with his team and other game developers the great work yeah, in Metal Gear Solid V. And then we found out uh, a few days before the, the show that uh, Mr. Kojima had to decline our invitation. We thought he was originally going to come, and then he couldn't mm -hmm. um, because Konami uh, wouldn't let him uh, fly because he was an employee of Konami still. And they said, hey, you can't take those days off to go to America. So I didn't really plan anything to say. It wasn't scripted, but when the game won an award and then Mr. Kojima wasn't there to accept it, uh, I think people were very disappointed. And Kiefer Sutherland got up, who was the voice of Snake in MGS5, 
um, accepted the award, and that was fine. But when we came back to me on camera, I just thought I had to explain why Mr. Kojima wasn't there because I wouldn't want anyone to think that he, you know, he doesn't want to come, doesn't want to come yeah. or he's not interested and he's, he's not grateful for all the uh, recognition. So I just was very uh, honest and said, here's what happened is that he wanted to be here but he wasn't allowed to come here by Konami. So I just think, you know, you have to be honest with the audience and explain uh, what happened. And, you know, Mr. Kojima is very polite, and I don't think he'd ever say that on Twitter. So um, I mentioned something that was very honest, and then the, the whole audience, you know, booed, and they were very disappointed in Konami, um, which was sad. But then, you know, the next year, it was great, because yeah, then he course. could come to TGA, and we gave him the big award, and I gave him a speech. So I'm very proud that he, he got that award. So he is coming this year, right? I hope so. Yeah, I mean, we're just starting this year, but he's been to he's been to every TGA except the one he wasn't allowed to come to. Um, so he's a great friend of the show. He's, the I news so. is that he told you that he can come, or you'll get a kind of uh, official letter from Konami said he can. Yes. Yeah, I think because he was uh, still an employee of Konami, I think they said you can't, you know, you can't take those days off to fly to Los Angeles because you no, have to I be mean, at work. Did, did Konami send you a mail about that? Or? Oh, no. Um, I didn't really hear anything from Konami. I kind of wondered if they were going to say anything. So after that, is there any uh, Konami guys contact you or they... Uh, no, no, I mean, I think no, I talked to... you shouldn't do that. I mean, yeah, I, know, I talked to some people at Konami. It's interesting. Some people at Konami, I think, actually said to me that... They were like, oh, we're glad you said that, because they don't necessarily agree with the <laughs> A lot decision. of people support Kona Kojima, yeah. right? Kojima, yeah. So, um, no, I never heard from any Konami executive um, or anything. We, have, we don't really do a lot of work with Konami now, because we don't really make that many um, you know, console video games besides yeah. the, the PES um, soccer. So, yeah, no, we didn't hear much from them. I thought maybe we would, but, uh, yeah, no, it's moved on. That's been, you know, three, three years ago now. Okay. Um, so, long time. So, during the, the, the five years of the Game Awards, including yes. the past year for the, the Video Game Awards, yeah. so what's, what's the biggest problem you have encountered for the previous years? Good question. Um, I mean, I think the, the biggest problem or challenge, uh, personally, has been, you know, launching the Game Awards and finding the money, because I basically risked all my own personal money. Um, you know, instead of buying a house, I kind of bought the Game Awards and created the Game Awards, I should say. Um, so that was a really big challenge. And then I think the other challenge, um, you know, that we faced over the years is finding the way to um, be credible, because we like to sometimes use celebrity or music sort of in the show to make a, a bit of a spectacle to it. But we have to do it in an authentic way. And I think, you know, especially over the years we were doing it at Spike, it was a little challenging to find the right celebrity to sort of come and endorse the games. And now I think we've done a really good job um, at Game Awards, and that's, we've sort of evolved our thinking on that. But that's always been another um, sort of uh, big challenge. And then you know, the third challenge that I face as well is that because I'm so closely associated with the show and it's my show, when we announce the nominees, there are inevitably some game developers who are very disappointed they don't get uh, nominated, yeah. and they think, personally, I decided not to nominate them. And I don't <laughs> even vote on the awards anymore because I'm too sort of involved yeah, in the yeah. show. I don't think it's fair. But uh, people still, you know, treat it as, you know, Jeff, you know, you, you disappointed so us. Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> like, why didn't you pick us? So um, that's always heartbreaking for me because you want to celebrate the games, but inevitably then people get a little disappointed. Um, and, you know, so many game creators do such amazing work. They devote their lives to building these games. You want everyone to feel good. So that's a part of the challenge. So you just mentioned celebrities in fact, yes. the TGA that I remember that several years ago when yeah. you uh, invite, invite like a... Uh, uh, too many celebrities. Yes. So the gamers will feel not so happy about that, right? Exactly. Is that is that a kind of uh, kind of uh, the, the the gamers hobby because they want to focus on the game, mm -hmm. right? But what was yeah. Your I mean, that? I think part of it is that you know, gaming. Those of us that do play games are very passionate of and proud that we're gamers and we've been gamers for a long time. So sometimes when you know a celebrity gets involved, if they're not authentically a gamer then I think people really reject that because it feels like they're coming, you know, to sort of be a part of games for the wrong reasons, for like a business reason versus a personal reason and love of games. And I think the thing that we found is we don't need those people anymore. Um, you know, if you're a real passionate game fan, then we want you to be there. So someone like Jack Black really loves video games. Yeah. So someone like uh, Guillermo del Toro is a big video game fan. Yes. He's there to support Him, Hideo no. Kojima. And then when he gave the award to Cuphead, Cuphead. you could tell he really cared. So I think the thing for us is you can't, it can't be fake. It has to be people that really you know, do love and play video games. And if they do, and they speak the same language as a video game fan, it's great. But if they're just a celebrity coming because you know, they were told to come to promote their new movie, um, and they don't love video games, this audience you know, pushes back because they say, well, why are you here? It's like, this is our night. 
It's about games and game creators. And you know, to me, Hideo Kojima is the you know one of the biggest celebrities in the world yeah. in video games. Um, and that's enough. So I think what we've proven is we don't need celebrities to make the show successful, but if there's the right celebrity that really wants to be there to pay respects to game creators, we love having them. Yeah. So you have, like last year, you have 30 awards yes. for, the, for, the TJ, uh, for, the, for the TJ, right? Yeah. So can you tell me something about how you like select the nominees, sure. how you decide to get these awards for each of the, the awards? Yeah. So the awards are, you know, we have an amazing uh, statue that uh, Weta Workshop that uh, Peter Jackson built for Lord of the Rings Good. created. Um, and we have 30 awards and the nominees are based on uh, a vote from a jury of press or media around the world who p select their favorite games. Mm -hmm. um, so we're excited that you guys will be as part of that this year as well. But we'll have uh, about 50 media around the Thank world you. that select their nominees. Um, and then we announce the nominees. And then the winners are selected by that group, and then we also let the fans vote as well to select sort of their favorites. And in China, we've done, you know, the past few years, with, yeah. in partnership with you guys, we've done a, a Best Chinese Game Award, which has been really cool to see, you know, different games. Yes. So sometimes it's like, you know, Monument Valley, League of Legends, <laughs> but then there are all these other games that I don't, you know, I think it was like JX3 HD, yeah, and all that, which you guys found. Yeah. yeah, which That's you guys know. It's a popular game in China. Exactly, which is great, and I, yeah. that's what I love about it. I'm like, I've never heard of this game, but clearly it's really big over there. So I love the sense of discovery that we can, uh, you know, find out about other games around the world. But yeah, it's, it's kind of a nomination process and then a winner process, and we don't tell anyone the winner until the show happens uh, live at uh, the awards. Okay, so currently the Game Awards is more focused on the American market, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Do you have any plan to expand the territory for the Game Awards, like going to the world or something? Yeah, we'd love to. So, you know, the Game Awards is here in America, but is viewed around the world. Um, you know, you guys air it in China for us, you've been a great partner, and mm -hmm. around the Thanks. world when we look at the um, you know, the data on where people watch it. People are watching in Brazil, in Australia, in London, in China, Japan. It really people Korea, around. right? Yeah, absolutely all around the world. People watch it, which is really amazing to see because I come out of a background where I was an American television producer. I really only thought about like people in America. And now I love that, you know, most people around the world really love and appreciate games. So it's a global show, but I definitely think, you know, down the road we'd like to do more to learn and celebrate uh, games in different markets. So as you said, the award we do with you in China, there are a bunch of other games that come out there that American folks don't understand and people around the world don't understand. So I think there's an opportunity to do something there to look at how can we look at you know, the, the market in China and how do people play games? What's the opportunity? What's there? So we definitely have thought about maybe doing some you know, local shows or local celebrations of games. And honestly, down the road, I'd, my secret desire has always been to uh, move the Game Awards around the world at some point, sort of like Good. the Olympics. And it's like Good. we always have done it in Los Angeles, but you know, maybe one year we'll do the Game Awards in London or in New York or in Tokyo. Um, so we're thinking about that and also thinking about opportunities to do things um, around the world. You know, I was lucky enough to come to China uh, <laughs> yeah, recently with so. you. And now it was great. I mean, yeah. to spend time with you in Shenzhen and kind of look at you know, China and we're fascinated about what's going on over there. So yeah, well, you know, my goal with Game Awards is to celebrate games no matter where they're from, who's playing them, what language they're in. So if, if we can find a way to do that somewhere else in the world, we'd love to good, do it. Good, good. So, okay, let's talk uh, talk about something about the E3. How many yeah. how many E3 have you been here? I've been to every E3. Every since, since 1995, uh, 1995 right? 1995, yes. Wow, that's uh, like uh, 23, 24, years. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So for the for the whole uh, video game market in, in America, because yeah. I I have been E3 since 2004. Yeah. At that time, it, it is the like the 10th anniversary for the yeah. for, for the E3. For at that time, it's like the the whole market mm -hmm. in America is like in the in the peak. Yes. And uh, but in the 19, uh, I think in 2007, mm -hmm. they they goes down. The e whole E3 becomes yeah, scaled smaller. down, yep. smaller. But now it comes back. So it, that 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 shows the it's. The, the curve of the, of the video game market in, China, uh, in America? A little bit, but I think, you know, it's, the challenge with E3 is that all the companies have to come together and agree what E3 is going to be, how it's going to look, who's involved, and when you get, you know, competitors, 
like Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, EA, Activision. It's very hard to get everyone to agree. Yeah. And I know this from the Game Awards because you know it's like very hard to get everyone <laughs> to be a part of the show and feel happy. You cannot and satisfy balanced. everyone in the same in the same time. Exactly. Right? It's very difficult. So I spent a lot of my time kind of managing, you know, everything. And I'm actually honored that all the game companies do trust me to make a fair show. But that's one of the things I think E3 has had with a challenge. So. Um, yeah, the two years they went to Santa Monica, I think it was 2007 Seven, and 8. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it was just because the show was getting so big, it was getting so expensive for game companies, they needed to sort of take a little bit of a break. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think it necessarily meant that the industry was you know, falling apart or anything. I think they just couldn't agree on where E3 should go. They tried it for a few years. And they're like, no, we miss the old big E3 yeah. downtown Los Angeles, so let's bring it back. Event, right? Exactly. So it was really just, I think, you know, a hiccup for a few years um, where they weren't quite sure, and then they tried it, and you know, just like sometimes when people, you know, in a relationship, like break up, and then they think about <laughs> it, and they're like, oh no, actually, maybe I, you know, I missed that. I want to go back to that. Um, so it's a little bit of that, I think, is what happened um, for those two years. And no, the gaming industry, you know, keeps growing in America. Um, you know, certainly the types of games people play are changing a little bit, and now people are playing more free-to-play games, PUBG, Fortnite, you know, mobile games. So there are other things. It's not just the console games. Um, but E3, I think, is such an important moment for anyone who plays video games that I think it'll always be around in some form. Good. So the video game industry has been developing in America like almost 40 years, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, what do you think of the business? Well, is that too old? Because, you know, for currently the people would like to the free games, yeah. especially when we have the mobile phones and the yeah. PCs. That, but the, for the console game that you have to buy a console first, then you purchase for each different yeah. software. Do you think is that, a bit, that this kind of business mode will be too old or old-fashioned thing? I think it's going to start to change for sure. And it's like you know the idea of a physical disc that you put in a machine. Um, it's a little antiquated. I mean, even in America now, like I you know I don't buy many DVDs or anything of movies or TV yeah. shows. I usually stream them. So I think yes, down the road people are going to you know probably you know get all their games over the internet and play them. And I think the other thing that's changing is, you know, I love a great story game where it's sort of, you know, a game I can play for yeah. 20 hours and be finished with it. But a lot of games now, they're these ongoing stories where you can play every day with yeah, your yeah, friends yeah. and yeah. be more of that. So I think there's also going to be some shifts there where people will play more free-to-play games, more ongoing games. We have an award now at the Game Awards called Best Ongoing Game. And that recognizes a game that has come out in a previous year that may still be, you know, doing updates. So like Overwatch is a great example of a game where they keep keep updating the game, it sort of never Even ends. Even like uh, Rainbow Six, right? Exactly. They have yes. the year three. Right. Rainbow Six is a great example. That's a game that kind of came out and did okay, yeah. and over time it continues to grow and more yeah. people keep playing it. So yeah, I think that's the other trend. And you know, when I think of Game of the Year at the Game Awards, that's something that we think very deeply about because Game of the Year might be a game that actually came out in a previous year, mm. but had a really great year. Like Fortnite got nominated last year for you know, in one of the genres, but this year it's having such an amazing year. Some people would say, hey, Fortnite should be nominated for Game of the Year this year, even though it came out last year. So yeah, it's, 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 the industry is going to evolve, but then I play a game like God of War or I get excited about Red Dead Redemption 2, and like, I know they're going to be great story games still, but there'll be other types of games as, okay. as well. Good. That's good. Yeah. So people like uh, before the PS4 was launched, yeah. that people would say PS4 may be the last generation of the console game. Yeah. But actually, the PS4, I mean, including Xbox One and Nintendo Switch, they made a, a big success in yeah. here. What, what, what do you think about the future of the industry? We'll probably have another generation of traditional game consoles. Um, you might, you know, even now with my PlayStation 4, I download a lot of my games, but it's still, you know, a, a box. Um, yes, down the road, I think also, you know. Your mobile phone is, you know, very powerful now. So I think eventually this may, you know, be able to, you know, have games that you just sort of like send to your television, or this becomes sort of your device for everything, and it's sort of in the cloud. And I can play a game as great as God of War, like on my phone with my controller. So um, I think, you know, games are going to move in more a lot, move with you. So like Nintendo Switch is very popular in America because you can take that on an airplane, you can take it on the road, but it's still the console quality. Um, so I think you're going to see console quality game experiences uh, be able to move with you in different places. Like when I check into my hotel room here, I might just be able to call up my PlayStation, which right now you can't do. So I think those types of things are going to happen. Um, it'll be more kind of in the cloud and streaming based. But uh, I think there's still a huge opportunity for you know great games on a television side. I don't believe you know everything's just going to be on your mobile phone. What about a, what about the price of the game? I mean. Just like the the, the uh, fifty nine ninety nine yeah. uh, price has been last for like ten years, yeah. but the, the economic the economic has grown very very fast in, yeah. in the ten years. 
So what do you think? You're you gonna say that the game will be much, much more, uh, more and more expensive, or I think it so. will keep the same. Well, time? I think I think people will end up paying more for games over time, but they may not pay up front. So it's like you know Fortnite, very popular in America, and they have Battle Royale, um, which you know is free to download. But then you can buy you know skins and characters and other content. So when you look at your bill at the end of the year, you're probably like, oh, I spent you know a hundred dollars, yeah. not fifty nine dollars. Um, so I think there'll be other ways to monetize games and play games that may not just be paying up front a ton of money. For certain, you know, like a God of War or a console game, I think that's a story console game that's probably still going to be the model. may even get a little more expensive because those games are so expensive to make. But I think there'll also be other ways you can play games that don't require you to spend so much money up front. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's what I want to say because like the game like God of War, I think yeah. it's much, much more worth than $60. Yes. Right? Even even they sold like $80 or $100, I would buy that. Yeah. Because I, I, I was worried about if the if the, the, the developers can get the money back. So because if they, they only take, get the money back and earn the profit from it, yeah. so they will encourage them to build more and more great games, right? Do you yes. agree with that? I agree, yes. And I think, you know, I equate something like a God of War or a Rockstar game. It's like going to a big concert or a big show. It's like you're going to invest more money because it's so spectacular. It's special. Um, it's not the game you play every day. It's a game you play one weekend because it's so artistic and beautiful. Yeah. Like you were showing me the Art of God of War book when we were in China. And it's just like amazing the artistry that goes into that. So yes, I think some of those games, I would be willing to pay more money. <laughs> I don't know about you. You would be right. Yeah, of course, yeah. of course. I always want to the the, the great de developers could, yeah. could get a more profit from it. Okay, so let's go back to the the, the topic of the game. That yeah. the people would say the the game now is a kind of art. Uh -huh. But normally we would say the art is like the movies, the paintings, you know, the novels. Yeah. Would you agree that gaming is a kind of art right now, or it oh, may absolutely. still need time to to grow? No, gaming is absolutely an artistic endeavor. I think you look at the the quality of the art and the music and the storytelling in these games and I think it's kind of like it's a it's a new type of art so uh, yeah I think games to me actually are even more powerful art than movies or, or music or television because I think it's immersive and you actually it's art that you can affect you actually can be the author and make choices in this art so yeah I think that's an argument that I think is long past at least for me personally like I see games as absolutely artistic and you know when I meet these game creators, and I see the, the artists that work on these games, and the technicians, and the storytellers, I think they absolutely are artists. In many ways, they're people that could have gone into making movies, or television, or animation, but they chose to make video games. But they're artists, they just happen to be working in the gaming medium versus making an animated movie. Yeah, I agree. So let's talk about this year's event. Even yes. currently, we are. this interview happens before this year's E3, yeah. but uh, People will see it after E3. Yes. So, do we have any ex uh, expectations about this year's E3? Well, I think it's going to be a great E3. Uh, you know, a lot of great big games uh, from all the companies. Like everyone's going to have a good E3. Uh, everyone's really excited to see a lot of the games from PlayStation because they've got uh, The Last of Us Part Two, yeah. Death Stranding from Hideo Kojima, uh, Marvel Spider-Man coming out as well, uh, and then a brand new game from Sucker Punch, the creators of Infamous, called Ghost of Tsushima. So, those are th th three big games. Mm -hmm. Nintendo is going to have uh, Super Smash Brothers for the Switch, which is going to be great. We don't know much about it, but they are going to have it here. Yeah. And then the big, I think, open question is, what is Xbox going to have? Because you know we haven't heard much about Halo or Gears of War or other big Xbox games. So I'm curious to see which games Xbox is going to have to reveal. So that's kind of the the big question mark, I think, at E3. But it's going to be a very very big show. Um, a lot of amazing games, and I get excited because you know there will be a few surprises. I think of games we're not expecting, which everyone gets excited about, sees the big trailers, uh, but also just going to be so many other like fun moments and great games to play. So again, I've been coming for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, this is it's it's like a it's a holiday for me. It's such a celebration, and of it's course, exciting to kind of kick it off with you. Um, as I said, I don't know what E3 is going to be like, but I can't <laughs> wait to get there. Yeah, me too, because this is the 15 years of yeah. me to come into E3. I'm also looking forward to see what is going to happen this year. I yeah. hope that in a couple of days after that, uh, all the press conference or the E3 will satisfy yeah. you and to see that uh, if you any game that you are expecting now yeah. to could uh, become real, right? I know, yes. Okay. Yeah, that's why it's like, you know, there are lots of rumors. Some of them will be true, some of them won't be true. Same thing with around Game Awards, where people are always speculating. And <laughs> I know it's at Game Awards, and so I was like, guys, that game doesn't exist. It's not going to happen. But yeah, I mean, that's part of the fun is the excitement. Um, and I think there will be some good surprises this week. 
Okay, thank you for having me here.、Yeah. That's all for today. I hope、okay. that you can come to China again because last time、so. you enjoyed the food in Shenzhen, right? I had great Wuhan noodles, coconut chicken. I'm in. Thank you, Charles. Okay, so what was?、Uh, Hello, everyone in China. I'm Jeff Keeley, the creator of the Game Awards, and I want to thank you so much for your support of the Game Awards. I started the show five years ago with a vision of celebrating how much I love video games, and I'm so glad many of you love them too. Thank you for tuning in and watching the show. We've had a great partnership with Tencent over the past few years to bring the Game Awards live to China.、Uh, we're going to continue that this year. The show will be back in December on December seventh in China this year. I hope that you'll tune in again for the Game Awards 2018. We're going to celebrate our love of video games and all the best games. So thank you for all your support.、Uh, I was just recently in China and had a great time there. I look forward to coming back again soon. And hopefully one day we'll、uh, we'll have the Game Awards China. See you soon.